Where am I running to? Is it back to the feet of Jesus to say thank you and it's yours? Or is it leading to myself? And what a weird, lonely place that is to end up doing all these things and just realize, wow, wow I did that for myself. Welcome to Dreamers and Disciples. I'm really glad you joined us for the podcast today. We have a great episode because we have Tiffany Hudson on the show. And Tiffany has been a good friend for years. I served with her for many years at Elevation. Uh, she's not only a truly anointed worship leader, which is probably how you know of her, but she also really loves Jesus and the church. So today you're going to hear her heart from the Lord, which she has such a passion for God's presence that I think is going to encourage you. You're also going to hear what her parents did to raise her to love Jesus and the church. Uh, she shares some of her thoughts on what this generation needs to understand about idolatry. And then also, I believe she's going to encourage you if you are walking through a hidden season where you feel forgotten, you feel like nobody sees you and what you're trying to do to follow God. I believe she has a word just for you. But before we get to that interview, I want to remind you that you can read the first chapter of my upcoming book, This Dream Is Not For You, releases in September, but you can read that first chapter right now for free at wadejoy.com. This book wrestles with the question of what do you do when your dream seems over, when you feel like you hit a dead end? And also, what do you do when you got your dream and it wasn't what you thought it was going to be? I share parts of my story that I've hinted at on this podcast, but I've never shared this level of detail before like I do in the book. And I also just share what I've learned about how to trust God with your dreams. And so if you have a dream in your heart and you're wondering what to do with it as a Christian, then I really believe this book is for you. So if you love the first chapter after downloading that for free, would you please consider pre-ordering the book? I have some surprises coming soon for anyone who pre-orders. I don't want you to miss out on that. Plus, it really helps show uh, retailers and stores like Barnes & Noble and Amazon that they need to carry a lot of the books. So help us get this message to as many people as possible. Links for everything are in the show notes and the YouTube description. Now, like I mentioned before, Tiffany is a worship leader at Elevation Church. You probably know her from Elevation Worship, and she's actually releasing her first solo worship album called Hidden Here on July 21st. So it's either about to come out or it's already come out, depending on when you've listened to this episode. But make sure you stream that album, get those songs into your heart. I promise you, you're going to be so encouraged by the music that she's releasing. And I believe you're going to feel so refreshed and encouraged today after this conversation. So let's jump right in. Tiff, welcome to Dreamers and Disciples. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so honored to be a part. I'm so excited to hang out and just catch up for a bit. I know this, this, I've been looking forward to this for a while. So we've known each other for a long time. When did you yes. first, I guess, were you an intern first at Elevation? I was an intern. I think it was back in like 2016-ish. 2016. So I know, a long time ago now. I know, that's that's so crazy to think because you were an intern and then you were part of, was it Prodigy at the time? Like our apprenticeship program? 2K2. 2K2. Yep, so throwback to names. 2K2. Yeah, I was an intern during college, like in between my junior and senior year. Um, and then I went back to college, I graduated, and then I came back and did the apprenticeship program. So I, my journey with Elevation was kind of spanned over like a good amount of time. And then after that apprenticeship program, I came on to staff and been on staff ever since. Well, obviously, that's how we got to know each other from when I was on staff as the worship pastor. Absolutely. But you've just always been such a bright light in any room you're in and any encounter, because you just, you're one of those people that I feel like just radiates the love of Jesus in any encounter. Mm -hmm. um, wow. And so I'm just excited to have you on the podcast to share your heart. Before we get into anything serious though, uh, people may not know that I, I tend to think that I'm a matchmaker. It's, 
It's something that I love. I, yes. I have mixed success. I wanted really, <laughs> I tried really hard to take credit for you and mate, your husband getting yes. together, but I, I don't think I can take any credit for that. But I was thinking the other day about when I found out that y'all were dating, Yes, taking mate on that walk around the office at Elevation yep. and trying so hard to intimidate him <laughs> that he needed to treat you right. But if you don't know mate, he's twice my size. <laughs> And it's quite muscular and I am whatever the opposite of tall is. <laughs> oh my god. But I did my best to try to to try to intimidate him. Did it work? You played your part. And honestly, that is an infamous story now with our relationship <laughs> of the time that we've we're trying to keep it low key. We started to date. We didn't want people to know yet. But of course, you found out, our friend David found out. And y'all just tag teamed. You you let him know, set him straight <laughs> right. that you better not mess up. You better not do anything. So we laugh about that a lot. And it's probably why your relationship was successful after that point was that <laughs> one conversation. So you got the credit. There you go. That's all I it's want all in life yours. Is, is credit. That's what this so whole podcast. So you can podcast. reach out to Wade for um, matchmaking things yes. that you, all the things you need. All the things. That's what I'm going <laughs> to turn this podcast into, a matchmaking I love it. relationship <laughs> podcast. Well, let me ask you the question that I start out every episode with right now, and that is, what are you dreaming about, Tiffany? That's a beautiful question. Um, funny enough, I kind of dream about like very normal, ordinary things. Like I think when I'm when I'm in like a busy season with travel or with life and with church and ministry. Usually where my head and my heart goes is to like mundane and simple and ordinary are the things I dream about. So I dream about like being a fam, like having a family and becoming a mom. Sometime I dream about just like weekends where I'm like working in my garden and like going yeah. to the farmer's market. And it sounds kind of silly, but like I feel so blessed to be in a position where I've lived so many of the dreams God has put in my heart, which is so humbling. Like I'm genuinely so grateful to God and to all the people along the way that have like helped me get to live those things. And so I feel like I'm in a place now where I'm like, I'm kind of dreaming for like the simple and just family life is really on my heart lately. So. Well, I love that you're dreaming about the ordinary things. And I think yeah. a lot of times we think our dreams are only about the big things or the dramatic yeah. things in our life, but I think a lot of times the most beautiful things in life and the most beautiful gifts from God are the ordinary. And so I, I love that answer. Wow. Um, and like you have a song out right now, which I love. Um, Thank and an you. album coming out soon called Hidden Here. Yes. And I, I wonder wh where does that whole concept come from? Because when I think of simple and ordinary, a lot of times I think of hidden, like people don't wow. celebrate those moments. Yes. What caused you to write that song and why is that like resonating in your heart right now? Absolutely. Well, I'm I'm super, super thankful that that song is out now. Um, we wrote it maybe like two years ago, but um, it was actually our sweet friend, Jane Williams, that brought up the whole idea and, of how the hidden things are the holiest. And we began to dive into like, you know, a lot of the most sacred things in life aren't seen by others. They're not like easily consumable. They're very mm -hmm. hidden. They're very private. Um, and I just dove into, we dove into what that looks like in our lives and our relationship with the Lord. And like, in my life, my favorite times with the Lord are unseen and they're mm -hmm. hidden and they're not on a stage. They're not things that other people have seen or been able to consume. They're just like between me and the Lord and how holy those moments are. Like, that's the idea The hidden things are the holiest, the mm -hmm. things that nobody else you know, I think things can become a little bit cheaper when the more that they're like seen by others, but when they're so like precious and hidden, I just find it to be so like immeasurable, the value of those moments. And so um, that's kind of what it's all about. Also, one of my life scriptures is Psalm um, 91. And it says, those who dwell in the shelter of the most high will rest in the shadow of the almighty. And that verse has always stuck out to me of like, what does it mean to rest in his shadow? Like to mm. be hidden in his shadow. Um, it just like, it's not about us. It's not about our time to shine. It's not about our time to be seen. It's about 
the more that we can remain hidden in Him so that He's seen. And so the Lord has taken me on such a beautiful journey, trying to teach me some of these lessons. And of course, I've got so much further to go and so much more to learn, but it's been such a beautiful process. How do you cultivate a heart that is drawn to the hidden places when you're also on stages in front of a lot of people? It seems like those can be very two very conflicting emotions and two very conflicting, um, I guess, environments or atmospheres yeah. to be in. So how do you keep your heart posture in the hidden place? Oh, that's a really good question. And I love that. We're talking about it because I feel like it's so important. And mm -hmm. I would say that everybody deals with the temptation to make it about themselves or about all the wrong things, including myself. So one side of it is like being given influence or a platform keeps me on my knees because I've felt the temptation of, mm -hmm. oh goodness, like I can see where my mind's going or where my heart's going, or maybe some of the desires or motives that feel like they're shifting. And it keeps me on my knees because... I so don't want it to be about anything other than the Lord and His plan and His purposes. Um, and there's also an element to like knowing the Lord and being grounded in Him before and after all of the opportunities or disappointments mm -hmm. of like, thankfully, I've I've been able to cultivate such a grounding relationship with the Lord before I ever got asked to, you know, sing or get an opportunity, you know, that kind of yeah. thing. And so I felt like it's the kindness of the Lord to truly like ground me in those things. And, but at the same time, it's also like the before and after of like, even after an opportunity, where am I running to? Like, mm -hmm. is it back to the feet of Jesus to say, thank you. And it's yours. Or is it, you know, leading to myself and, what a weird, lonely place that is to end up yeah. doing all these things and just realize, wow, wow, I did that for myself. Like it's just empty and hollow. And so I guess that's kind of a roundabout well, <laughs> answer um, to well, your question. Well, even like you bringing up, you know, your life before, um, you know, the platform you have now, I know your, your family and your parents and they're amazing. Yes. Can you talk about your background growing up and what you learned from them? And and even like what, when did God like really first captivate your heart? What did that look like? I love this question. I already feel myself like tearing up <laughs> speaking about my family, but um, I was born into a ministry family. We were evangelists for 13 years, kind of the first 10 years of my life, and then ended up planting a church in like a small town in Pennsylvania and that's where I met the Lord. Like truly, that is where He captivated my heart. And I honor my parents because I'm thankful to say, like I grew up with such good examples of what it means to like love the Lord off platform. I mean, I have from my earliest memories, I'm upstairs sleeping and I can hear my dad downstairs, you know, the worship music's playing and he's reading his Bible and seeking oh. God. Like those are my earliest memories. And what an amazing shepherd and pastor he is as well. Like I grew up with a dad that would leave on a whim to visit someone at a hospital and would at all hours, like all hours be so pastoral and caring for others and show up for people. And I think having that example of like, that's what ministry is. Hmm. Like it really wasn't about his time preaching on a Sunday morning. Like, of course he's gifted in that, but I saw so much more the shepherding yeah. aspect off platform. Like he's going to be there for people. They're going to call and there's a tragedy that's happened in our community and he's going to go and he's going to pray. Mm. And that's what I saw growing up. And my mom, of course, was the same, like on board. So I think understanding what ministry was for my parents was like, just again, immeasurable value. Like I really got to see that um, firsthand. And then when it came to, the Lord captivating my heart. It was, it was never about like worship or singing for me. I love to sing and I grew up singing. My family all sang, like we're musical and ministry and all those things. But it wasn't until like I felt broken for God's presence and 
we grew up in like more of a Pentecostal charismatic environment and altar calls happened every Sunday. And I just remember every Sunday responding to the altar call. Mm -hmm. And I didn't care if it was rededicate your life to (laughs) Jesus or if you need healing or if you want to just come up and get more of God. I found myself so hungry Mm -hmm. to receive more of God that I'd be up there with whoever else responded just to receive more of Him. And so it really was like, in some ways, I feel like I've like stumbled upon worship leading or, you know, that aspect of ministry, but it really was His presence that I just Mm -hmm. like craved more than anything, sitting at my parents' piano, only knowing four chords, but learning to sit there until I felt God's presence come into the room. Mm -hmm. And even still to this day, like, I I cry and that because those moments I would sit there until I felt the Lord come Hmm. and I would break down and cry in his presence at at my parents' piano that's out of tune. And it's like things you can't really explain, but when you experience him in that way, it's like you can't settle for anything else. It's like that is, you know, the real and you felt the real. So anything else you experience is like, it pales in comparison because you felt the real thing and know the real thing. So that's a little bit of the backstory. And I just, I I love how even on this, you know, Zoom or interview or whatever, I I sense your passion for God's presence and how Mm -hmm. that's the thing that truly anchors your heart. But as you were talking about your dad, what struck me as you saw the hidden in his life. Wow. And how something that was hidden was actually noticed by the, you know, someone who is about as close as you can get to him and how that's impacted the rest of your life. So I feel like when we are faithful in that hidden place, faithful with the hidden times of prayer, the hidden times of worship, the, the visits to the hospital that only that family knows about, it's not celebrated on social media. Yeah. Number one, God notices, um, but there's always somebody that's impacted by what's done in the secret place, whether wow. it's the character that's formed within us um, or something that Jesus deposits into us that we're then wow. able to give to somebody else. Someone else is always impacted. So it's really, I don't know, it's really powerful for me to think as a dad and I'm thinking about how to lead yes. my my three daughters. They're watching my hidden. Wow. Um, I don't know. I, there's something there that I felt like the Lord really spoke to me as you were talking about your dad. So that is so incredible to point out because I haven't even connected the dots in that way. If like someone else does see your hidden, and oh, yes, it's God, but it's also like your family and the people that are closest to you. And you're right. I'm like forever changed and impacted because of that. And I think of you and your sweet three girls watching you their whole life. And it's not till later in my life that I could really understand the depth of what that meant. But in the moment, you're just like, that's just what dad does. Like he just gets up early and he, you know? And so it's so sweet as I've like grown older and had more of an understanding for my parents and how much more I've appreciated their role that they played in my life. Yeah, that's, I I definitely, uh, I've told you many times before, like whatever dad secrets I can glean from your father, (laughs) I, I want all of them. Um, yes. and how to raise and how to raise daughters. Absolutely. Uh, now, when did you first though, I know the dream for you didn't start with, oh, I want to be a worship leader. You were just passionate about worship. When did you start seeing, oh, I could actually like, God's given me a gift to do this and I want to do it. What did that process look like for you? Oh, okay. Let me think about this. It was never a clouds parting moment where the Lord was like, this is what you're called to do. It was just like teeny little step after teeny little step. Um, I could point back to moments where I would be leading worship with maybe even like, I don't know, maybe my heart was like somewhere else, my mind was somewhere else, but I can point back to a few moments where it felt like the Lord used it or people would even give me encouragement in that area where I'm like, oh, maybe maybe God will use this in my life. And moments like growing up where I'd spend time with the Lord and felt like He spoke things over my life that I'd written in a journal, but never understood how they would come to pass. 
Um, and I, I would say I started like in college to really like practically say, I think this is what I want to do. Like, let me actually kind of get the tools in my belt. So learned a lot about corporate worship leading and songwriting and all those things and started to practice them more. Um, and again, it wasn't this like huge moment. It just was like, this feels right. And I always ca- felt called to serve the church. Mm. And I think my whole life I'll, I'll serve the church and maybe it won't always be through worship leading. I don't know. Maybe right now that's where God has me. Um, but I know forever I'll serve the church in some way. So I think it's like this one, not to dumb it down or make it too practical, but I'm like, it just made sense. Like I had a gift to sing. I loved his presence. How can I create or help steward, not create, help steward environments where we can be and linger in his presence? Because those are the moments that changed my life. How can I be a part of creating, not creating, sorry, stewarding those for other people? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a really helpful handles to give people because... I think sometimes we can over dramatize the word calling, like, mm-hmm. oh, I'm called to do this one thing for the rest of my life. Yes. And very rarely does that actually play out. Yes. Where I, I feel like we get different assignments in different seasons, and sometimes certain gifts come to the forefront in one season and others in, in the next season. And I do, I, I love what you said, like, your heart and your calling is to build the church. Hmm. And right now it looks like this, but maybe in 20 yeah. years, there might be something different about it. But I think that's a really helpful way to hold our gift and our calling loosely. Yes. And say, God, I'm, I'm called to follow you. I'm called to build your church. I'm called to love my family. I know I'm called to those things. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to use my gifts faithfully in what's in front of me right now and just yeah. steward that the best I can. So I think that's such a a countercultural way to look at calling mm. because even in the church right now, we try to define ourselves by what we do so often. Yes. Was it hard for you at all? Because I know how hard it was for me when I finally decided to write a book and release something on my own. I mean, you're a part of an amazing church, amazing ministry with Elevation Worship, and you've contributed a lot. You serve a lot through that. What was the process like for you to be like, oh, I actually, there's something in me that needs to come out through its own project that's not Elevation Worship. What was that like for you? Were there any insecurities you had to work through to do that? Yes. The short <laughs> answer is yes, all of them. Um, I I never felt like I was ever going to do a solo thing. Like It just never was in my heart. And maybe it goes back to insecurities, but I never felt like I had what it took to do that. I didn't think I had much to say. Um, I love and still, still love like being a part of a team, being a one member of a greater thing. Mm -hmm. And that's always been my heart. And so I never felt like I'd ever want to do anything on my own. Um, And it was early, I guess, 2022, uh, where I felt like the Lord kind of invited me into this season of writing. I'd kind of come out of like a creative drought. Mm -hmm. Like I would sit at my piano and... I genuinely felt so uninspired. Anything I would write, anything I would play was just like, not good. And so I kind of was really discouraged in that area in general. Like, I'm Mm -hmm. like, oh gosh, I guess I'm not a good writer. And all the things that I feel like I've dealt with my whole life, all those thoughts. Um, And then it kind of felt like something switched um, where even my time with the Lord felt like more of a download from Him and was receiving so much more in my quiet time with him. And when I'd sit at the piano, it felt like song after song came out with ease as opposed to the previous season where I would just struggle to get anything that I even liked. Um, So I felt like the Lord just kind of invited me into this process of writing. And um, I'm so grateful and I honor our church and our leaders that um, kind of gave me the green light to chase it and to— really go after what I felt like God was calling me to do. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, And I just began to explore and just see what maybe God was wanting to do. Felt like He put certain themes on my heart that felt important to Him. And for whatever reason, maybe handed me a little piece of it to say, like, write about this. And um, 
And I don't think that my project is very much corporate. I think maybe a few songs could you could sing on a Sunday. That'd be beautiful. But for the most part, it feels a little bit more personal and devotional and um, just songs for the everyday life mm-hmm. and the journey of trying to follow Jesus with all of your heart, all of your soul, of your mind. And um, that's kind of where I feel like these songs serve and they kind of came from that place in my own life. So that's a little bit of that. I'm so, so honored to get to release it and just looking forward to it. All the anticipation. Oh, and you asked about the insecurities. Sorry, I forgot. But it, I dealt with so many insecurities, like almost gave up on this whole idea, like, four or five times along the way of like, maybe I just don't have what it takes. Maybe I'm not good enough. Um, Comparing myself to other people. And Mm -hmm. that's like, I'll never be able to write a song like that. Like all all of the things and looking at a project and saying, no one else is going to understand this or no one else is going to get it. Maybe I don't have enough fast songs. I don't know have enough corporate songs all of the thoughts and feelings where I would just talk myself out of maybe the word the Lord gave me. Mm -hmm. Um, And it truly was like, there's nothing solo about doing a solo project. It took an army and a village of people around me that at times would lift up my arms and say, no, like we believe in this. And what a gift that is. Like to have anybody else possibly believe in you is such a gift. So the Lord's encouragement, other people's encouragement, my own conviction— all at times played a part in like keeping this thing going. So, yes. Yeah, I think um, I was talking to somebody yesterday about how we need other people in our life to help remind us of what is true. And because a lot of times the insecurity of my heart can overpower what I know is true in my head. Yes. And I think God speaks through other people and they can amplify what God has already said to us and help drown out that insecurity. And it's just one of the reasons why we need community. We need yes. church, we need family, and we need to let them in to those insecurities sometimes so that they know, oh, I need to help you know, lift up her arms in this season because she's struggling. Wow. So I'm grateful you didn't let the insecurity win because uh, I think these songs are gonna be a blessing for a lot of people. Thank you. But speaking of songwriting, Can you, I I know the answer to this story, but I love the story of when you first shared a song with Pastor Stephen. Yes. Can you, because I think there's actually a really valuable lesson there, but I'd I'd love for you to kind of take us back however long ago that was. Yeah. Well, let's see. I'd been on staff for a little bit. Um, Always felt the call to write, but never felt like I was good at it. But um, went through a season where I gave up on writing. This is the long story short. And um, felt like the Lord had slapped me in the face, sweetly and kindly, like He does, but basically said like, if I've given you a gift, it's irrevocable, so put your head down and work Mm -hmm. on it. So I had just been in this season of like, okay, I'm gonna put my head down and work on it. Doesn't matter if I'm good. Doesn't matter if anyone else likes it or hears it, which is easier said than done. But truly, I was like, in this process with the Lord. And Mm -hmm. I was writing with random band members and they were helping me build tracks to songs. And I was kind of in that season where I was secretly writing. Like I would never say I'm a writer, but Mm -hmm. behind the scenes, I was learning and practicing. And so get to this random Tuesday, I believe, and randomly got invited to go to a lunch with Pastor Steven. And it was like me and maybe like 20 other staff members around the table. It was kind of just Q&A format, let's let's get to know each other, let's ask questions. And so kind of came to a point where I was so nervous, but I wanted to ask my question. And so I raised my hand and I asked Pastor Steven, what do you do when you feel called to something, but you don't see any fruit and you don't feel like you're good at it? And of course, Pastor Steven was like, well, can you be more specific? Like, what are you talking (laughs) about? And so I ended up saying like, I feel like I'm called to songwriting but nobody has ever liked my songs and I've never, I've never seen fruit from it. Like, how do I know that I'm supposed to keep after it? Or if it's not even something I'm supposed to keep doing. And so in that meeting, he ended up asking me, do you have a song you can sing? And I was like, yeah, I, yeah, I think so. (laughs) So horrifically I stood up in front of this 
table of people and I sang a song I wrote a cappella, which oh, is wow. just horrifying. It's not a good way to like pitch your song, you know, like it's like it's not got a chance to make it anywhere. But ended up singing this song and um not to fast forward too much, but I think it was a few weeks later that I had been invited to come write with our team. And I don't know that I could fully say like why. I mean, I know that the Lord is sovereign and works in all of the ways, but I do remember the Lord impressing upon my heart, like whenever you, whenever the time came for someone to call your name and stand up, you had something to sing. And it wasn't because you're good or, you know, it's just because you decided through the Lord's kindness to not give up on the gifts He's given you and to work hard to put your head down yeah. and just go after it. So it you, was crazy. Do you remember the song that you sang that day? Vaguely, but I'm so <laughs> thankful no one will ever hear it. Uh, I was going to ask you to sing it for all of us now, but uh, I won't put you on the spot. Um, <laughs> but what I love about that story, though, is you were using the gift God had given you in secret even though no one else was, you know, tapping you on the shoulder saying, hey, that's good, or I want to use this. You were you were just faithfully working at what God had given you to do as unto Him. And then, like you said, when the time was right, you had something, you had collected something in this bucket that you had just been putting songs into just between you and God. And you finally had something to give yeah. when the Lord opened that door. And I think that's just such an encouraging word for people that just because someone else doesn't notice right now doesn't mean you should stop working. Yes. Like keep digging, keep writing, keep serving, and the Lord will bring it in front of who needs to see it, um, who it needs to impact, who it needs to help. Yes. Um, we have to be faithful with stewarding and managing what He's given us. God is the one who directs where it needs to go. Wow, that's beautiful. And I I think also like finding the reward in actually just being obedient and doing it. Mm -hmm. It was so powerful for me too of like I read this book and it was she was talking about how wildflowers bloom on like the highest hilltops and the deepest valley valleys that no other human eye will ever witness or will never walk upon to admire, to compliment, wow, these flowers are beautiful. No one else will ever see them, but they bloom because that's what they were created to do. And mm. I remember being so impacted by that of like, am I willing to use the gift that God Almighty gave me just because He gave it to me mm -hmm. and I'm grateful. And that's what He put inside me to do. And finding the reward in that yeah. changes everything. Because even to this day, I have disappointment in songwriting. I still go through insecurity that I'm not good or maybe I wasn't invited. And all those feelings I haven't graduated from. So if my mm -hmm. reward is still, if someone else is holding my reward in their hand, I'll never be satisfied in it. It's like, I have to find it in these moments of like, thank you God for this gift. And I ho I love it. Like, yeah. I want to tell you that I love it and I love to use it and I love to play with it and, you know, all those little analogies. So whatever defines you, you hand over the keys to your joy, your fulfillment. And so if you're wow. defined by an opportunity that's in the hands of someone else, wow, then you've given them the keys to your emotional wow. and spiritual well-being. But if you entrust that to God and let God define you, that's where we find true freedom and true joy. And it's something wow. that, I mean, you heard me talk a, a lot about this on staff, but I think so often we allow ourselves to be defined by our gift or defined by our calling. And I love how you just said, we're not defined by those things. Those are meant to be offerings back to the one who gave them to us in the first place. Yeah. And I think the fact that you fight so hard to, to do that is one of the reasons that when you do lead worship, it's coming from such an authentic place because you're not just offering something to God on a stage, you're offering it to Him mm. in the secret hidden place that we keep coming wow. back to. Thank you so much. That means a whole lot. And I, I also, if I can, want to honor you because what an example you've set of loving God in every season, of serving Him faithfully, faithfully in every season. Like, 
truly it's people like you that I've been able to watch and observe that have taught me how to like faithfully serve the Lord in little and in much and in all of the different seasons. And so I'm so grateful for just that message that has been echoed through your life for years. Like, I love that it's in a form of like a podcast right now where it's like we're talking about these conversations, but you've been talking about this for years and it's been so beautiful to get to learn from. And so I'm really, really grateful. Thank you, Tiff. Can you maybe elaborate or give someone a window into what your time with the Lord looks like? Yeah. Because that is a passion of mine to talk about prayer, to talk about personal worship, because I think sometimes it's hard for people to know where to begin yes. with that. So when we when we let them into our routines and our disciplines, it at least gives them something to, oh, maybe I should I should try that. So what does that look like for you? I know not every day, but in general. Yeah, absolutely. My favorite way to spend time with the Lord is in the morning. Um, I've found, I know people will say, do it whenever you're at your best, which I agree with. But I have always found excuses. If I push it off, I'll mm-hmm. do it later. I'll read later. For me, it's first thing in the morning or I pretty much won't. Um, and I love to just like, I have a little chair in my corner that I sit in and I'm reading through the book of Isaiah right now because that's a book that I've not really spent time in and all of my pages stick together. So I felt like the Lord was like, you need to go back and (laughs) and read this. So that's currently what I'm reading, either a chapter or a few a day. And um, But my favorite thing usually is just my journal. And it's full of prayers. It's full of honesty, like how David would come before the Lord Mm -hmm. with all of his feelings and all of his thoughts. That's how I feel about my journal. I'm like, if something happened to me, I would not care if anyone looked through my phone and looked through my text messages and my DMs. I don't care. If you look through my journal, I am embarrassed (laughs) and I am just like hiding because I don't want anyone to see what I write in my journal because it's just my most honest feelings Mm -hmm. and thoughts and prayers to the Lord. And I had a mentor one time tell me, she said, have a black pen and have a red pen and write what you feel the Lord's saying in red. And when you go back through your journal, it's so easy to see, oh, this is what God spoke to me. Um, I love that. And you can't like, you don't be like, oh, well, was that God? It's like, no, I in that moment, I said, this is what I feel that God's speaking to me. And it's so beautiful to look back on. And so that's a really good practice um, that I've kind of adopted as well. So journaling, reading, I love times of just like sitting and, and worshiping and praying as well. But um, I would say that's probably my favorite. I'm going to steal that black pen, red pen. Isn't trick. that I really, cool? I really like that a lot because I do think there's an important aspect of journaling of getting your heart on the page as a prayer in all of yes. its honesty, like you said, but then to not let it stay there, but to actually write what we feel like God is saying back to us. Yes. So yeah, I think that's a very practical tip. I, I love that. Can you tell me in your times of prayer right now and journaling, what are you burdened for right now with either this generation or for the church or for the people that you're ministering to right now? Is there is there something that the Holy Spirit is really placing on your heart to, to intercede for? Absolutely. Um, a few different things. What comes to mind is I feel the burden and the call to honestly help prepare the bride for the return of Jesus. Like, Mm. I feel that deeply in my heart, like the passage in Matthew about um, the 10 virgins who have the lamps and filling with oil so that they're ready for when the groom returns. Like, I feel such a burden for that of like, what does it mean to store up oil um, so that we're ready Mm -hmm. for the return of Jesus? That's a huge thing on my heart. The other thing I would say that I'm constantly reading about, even in Isaiah, which maybe is why the Lord is having me read that right now, but is idolatry. Like constantly the Lord says through Isaiah, I am the Lord and there is no other. There is no other. And he's rebuking Egypt and all of these different places for their idolatry and their love of idols and their love of other gods and their practice of worshiping other gods. Like that is what they are rebuked for. And I feel that so much in my generation and this generation that we're loving God and we're loving idols and 
I just am so convicted about that, like modern day idols. And there can't be any other gods, like there can't be anything above him. And so that's what kind of the Lord's been taking me through personally and something I've been praying for on behalf of our generation, our current culture. When you're talking about having this burden about exposing and repenting for idolatry, that resonates so strong with me because I think that's a similar passion of mine right now. Wow. And just realizing how I think there are certain things in our life that we're quick to name as an idol. And then there are certain idols that we give a pass to. Wow. And if you look through the Old Testament, there are a lot of times where you had kings that they tore down some of the high places. And yes, they still worshiped at the temple, but then they allowed worship at these other places that weren't prescribed by by Yahweh as appropriate worship. So they were trying to worship God on their own terms Mm -hmm. rather than on his terms. And I think that's such a word for today that you were saying, because there are a lot of idols that we have gotten comfortable with because we don't want to do the hard work of laying them down and really recognizing and submitting to Christ at the rightful place at the center of our life. Wow. And so, yeah, I've been challenged a lot in my life to like, what have I accepted? What have I allowed? What is getting the affection, the the attention of my heart more than Jesus? And it's taken me on a journey of the last two years or so of really having to be honest about some things in my life and allowing that conviction of the Holy Spirit. So I, I think there need to be more voices like yours of saying we can't settle for partial worship of God. Yes. We can't settle for partial partial lordship. It's hmm. complete 100% lordship of surrendering wow. to Jesus. So I just That's affirm powerful. that in you that like God's given you a voice to do that. Hmm. Thank you. That's so powerful. Wow. What would you say right now to the person who feels they feel like I have no choice but to be hidden because no one's noticing what I do? Can you just as we close our conversation, could you maybe minister to that person and and speak to someone who feels that they are hidden, but it's not by choice. It's by default. Wow. The first thing that I would say is what an honor (laughs) that God chose you and loves you enough to keep you in that space with Him. Like looking back over my life, it was those seasons that formed me and marked me more than any other season, more than a scene, opportunity season. It was the hidden season where there is no like light at the end of the tunnel. It's like, I'm here indefinitely. Um, What an honor that God chose you to be there. What an honor that He wants you so close. Soak it up. Fill your journals with what He's speaking to you. Um, You don't know why God has you there until hindsight usually, but there will be strength that is found There will be treasure that is found there that down the road you'll be able to pull from. Um, I just think, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I think of. Like you might not see it now, but there is a reason like God could be preparing you for something and let your roots grow deep. Let your foundation be established. Like don't take it lightly. Don't pass by because you want the next season to come so bad. Like, which I've done in seasons. I've like, oh gosh, I'm just ready for the next thing. Like, and almost like forsaken what Mm -hmm. could have been so special. Like, please don't like soak it in and soak it up. And um, I think what God will speak to you will be literal gold. Mm -hmm. And you'll maybe get into the next season and in some ways miss where God had you. That's what I've experienced in my Mm -hmm. life. And so that's what I would say is encouragement to you. I think that's a beautiful, just prophetic word to end this conversation on. Tiffany, I love your heart. I I love your devotion and your passion for Jesus. I love your commitment to the church, the way you serve so faithfully. And I just believe that your best days are ahead. So thanks for sharing your heart uh, with all of us here at Dreamers and Disciples. Thank you so much, Wade. I so enjoyed talking with you. Such an honor. We'll, We'll do it again soon. Yes. Thanks for joining us today for Dreamers and Disciples. I hope that conversation was really refreshing for you. And I I really encourage you to make sure you listen to Tiffany's new album, Hidden Here. I'll link to it in the show notes and in the description of the YouTube episode. 
but do that. And also, if you enjoy this podcast, if you listen to it most every week or every week, or maybe this is your first time listening to it and it encouraged you, will you please do two things for me? Will you leave a review that would really mean a lot to me if it was a five-star review, but also share the episode with a friend. Let's continue to keep this community of dreamers and disciples growing so that we can be a group of people that follow Jesus with open hands of surrender. See you back here next week. Mm -hmm.